AQ's Blog and Grill. Hey everybody and welcome to AQ's Blog and Grill. We're really excited today to have April Dunford with us. April is a, an executive consultant. She's a speaker and an author who helps technology companies make complicated products easy for customers to understand and love. She is globally recognized as an expert in positioning and market strategy and has launched 16 products into markets across her 25 year career as a VP marketing and a series of successful high growth startups. This is the uh, kind of your profile from your new book, April, uh, obviously awesome. And that's what we'd like to chat to you today. So welcome, April Dunn. Great, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Super. Now. April, you have a position on on marketing and as it relates to positioning. And you're wondering if we've been doing positioning correctly or effectively over the last 30 years. And some of this is based on your own experience and some of it is, is observational. So what is it that you think positioning is? It's a good question. You know, one of the things I learned early in my marketing career is if you got 10 senior marketers together in a room and said, hey, define positioning, you would probably get 10 pretty different answers. Maybe, and, maybe 15 from the 10. <laughs> right. So, you know, I don't, I don't think even though positioning is not a new concept, uh, I don't think it's well understood. Right. Uh, over the years, I've developed my own sort of thinking about it, and I define positioning this way. So de positioning defines how your product is the best in the world at delivering something that a well-defined set of customers cares a lot about. Right. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, like, and there's and there are a lot of pieces to that, and I think it's that complexity is what trips people up when they're trying to think about positioning. Yeah. So what I really like about your definition, and I think it's it's a much more relevant definition now, is the caring part. Um, when Reese and Trout wrote their book back in the, it was published I think in 1981, they were basically just about the product. Um, and they didn't take much into account as related to who it is that you were trying to connect with. And you've got that caring thing in that a well-defined set of customers will value or care about. And I, I think that's one thing that's setting your new book apart uh, that I wish people would read. So go out and get your copy of Obviously Awesome uh, by April Dunford. Is, is that where, you know, y your perspective, your mindset is coming from on this whole positioning question? Yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't. I'll tell you, I, I wrote, I read the Reason Trout book, just like everybody else, sure. uh, early in my marketing journey. And I love that book. I still love that book. Yeah. And, and, what I thought that book did really well is it, it, it gave you this idea of what positioning was. And for me, anyways, it really convinced me that, oh, this is super important and I'm going to have to figure this out. Yep. What I found it really lacking on was just any way to practically apply it. So, you know, like yeah. I just, there's yeah. no methodology. There was no way to do it. It was, you know, when, when marketers, you know, sometimes I get younger marketers will tell me, oh, content marketing, it's a new thing. I'm like, mm. no, I can give you a really good example of content marketing. 1982, these guys wrote a book and yep. it just got you all excited about positioning. But if you wanted to do positioning, the answer to that was you were supposed to call them. <laughs> and they were working with like Avis and Coke and Pepsi and stuff. And I was working at a startup. I'm like, I can't afford to call those guys. I'm not going to call them. So, and so, you know, I, I was left at the end of the book going, well, I know these guys know how to do it, but they're not giving me any hints how to do it. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do it myself. And I found that really frustrated and it, frustrating. And so I spent a good part of my career trying to come up with a methodology that I could use in a startup. So, it, you know, if I went to a new technology company and we had something brand new, how could I make sure that we could get to good positioning as quickly and efficiently as possible? And it took me a really long time to do that, even, you know, with Reason Trout's book sitting right on my desk every day. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't give me any clues. My book is 
essentially what I've learned through that process of trying to break positioning down into component pieces, figure out the best way to solve for the component pieces and smashing it back together. So it's intended as a handbook for all the people like me that got to the end of that recent trout book and said, okay, fine, I get it, I dig it, I, I know it's important, how do I do it? My book is the answer to how do we do it. <laughs> Can you tell us about your experience when you started at IBM and uh, you were asked to do a positioning statement and yeah. um, you didn't want to, but you did it. So, yeah. what, so what, what experience was that like? So, so this, this is how it went for me. So, you know, I read the reason trial book. I got this fancy marketing job. I'm trying to do positioning. I can't figure it out. I started taking all these classes um, and, and people kept saying, Oh, you know, you're not taking the right classes, April. That's how come you don't understand this. And so uh -huh. I took this class at Northwestern universities, you know, it's a fancy marketing school. Yeah. And so I go in there and there's a, there's a module in the course I'm taking called positioning. I'm like, great. I'm going to learn how to do positioning. Good. So this guy gets up and shows this positioning statement and I'm like, and then he gets to the end and he says, okay, so you just fill in market category, whatever, whatever, whatever. And you know, and then we're done. And, and he starts moving on to the next topic and I'm at the back and I'm like, whoa, 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 hold up there, <laughs> yeah. dude. Yeah. How, but how do we know? Like, like there's a blank there that says market category. And I explained the whole thing. I just repositioned. How would I have known that we would have been better positioned in this one market versus another? How do I pick the best market category to position my product in? Right. And the guy's answer was, you know, he kind of, he's sort of this older guy and he had his glasses on he kind of put his glasses on and he sort of looked at me down his glasses and he went, trust me, April, you'll just know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you don't, you don't, you don't know either. You don't yeah. know any better than I do how to do that. Yeah. And so I spent a few years thinking, well, there must be a way to do this. And it's just a secret that people don't want to teach me. And, and at one point I got this job at IBM. Now IBM has, this world-class product release process. In fact, other Fortune 500 companies, you know, spend money with IBM to have IBM teach them their, what is called the IPD process, their IPD process to release products because it's, it's, it's so good. Yeah. And, and so I'm launching a new product and I, I get the big handbook on how we're going to do this. And it's got 9 million modules. One of the things in there is positioning and I'm, I'm like, listen, I am going to find out how a world-class Fortune 500 company does this. It's going to be amazing. So I flip to that section of the book and I get there and it's one page and it's a stupid positioning statement. <laughs> and I was so mad. And my boss came in and, uh, and, and, and I'm sitting there staring at the thing. And I said, look, I'm not doing this thing. This thing is stupid. And, you know, and I go into my whole big rant. I'm like, look, we're just filling in the blanks. Like we can just write it down any way we want, you know? And my boss was like, he, he was, you know, he thought I was uh, painting the ass most of the time. And so he, he was kind of looking at me with this look on his face. And then he says, April, do you enjoy working at I? And I'm like, yeah, I was subtle. I, yeah, I do. That was very he's, subtle. He's like, do you like your paycheck? You get your big <laughs> paycheck you get every week. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, Paul, I do the darn thing. <laughs> and I did. Like, I kind of, it, it, in the end, I kind of raged. You know, I I filled it in kind of mockingly. Like, I was working on a a, a database product um, that that ran Unix and Windows. <laughs> so I filled the thing in. I said, you know, my product is a database. You know, that, that for database people that want to buy a database, unlike yeah. Oracle, you know, that, that that our database, you know, our differentiator was comes from IBM. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just filled the thing in, put it in the binder. No one looked. At it. I never looked at it. We basically crumbled it up, threw it in the garbage, never looked at it again. <laughs> and, I, and so at, at that point, I was like, you know what? No one knows how to do this. But but at that point, you know, I had done a series of startups where, you know, we came in, startup, the product grew really fast. We got acquired. I ended up at the big company. I stick around for a couple of years because you're kind of forced to. Then I leave and go to the next startup. And I did that like six, seven times in a row. And through the course of that, I repositioned a ton of products, like way more than a normal person would. <laughs> like <laughs> if you on IBM and work there, you know, you maybe positioned something once or twice.
Like at the end of it, I repositioned 16 products and I thought, you know, if anyone can figure out how to do this, it's me. Um, and so that's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. And why not? And the, the key to your success, because you have been you know, a very visible success in the whole marketing and branding uh, ecosystem, oh, okay. it is based on your um, ability to try new things and, and to experiment and bring new thoughts to, uh, well, older concepts um, like positioning. Now, one of the ways you've done that, I think in your in your book, um, Obviously Awesome, is that you, you say that positioning should be really context setting. Yeah. And I, I love that because again, it, it's saying, well, it's not just about content. It's about the context of what's in there. So can you help unpack a little bit for us yeah. the context versus content? So so this when I started, I had a hard time explaining to technical founders what the heck positioning was and mm. why it mattered. And so I kept coming up with different analogies for it. And the one that I found the most successful with technical people was this idea of context. And so I used to always give this example um, of there, there's this really famous context experiment from, uh, I think it was the eighties or the nineties. It's the Joshua Bell, uh, right. The Washington training. post, uh, so the Washington yeah. post does this experiment where they take arguably the best violin in the world. So, you know, a guy who's regularly selling out concert halls at $200 a ticket. Um, and they, they dress him and they put him in the, in the Washington subway and they have him like disguised as a busker. And the idea is he's going to be there and he's going to play his violin. And then they're going to see, you know, one, does anybody notice that the music is better than it is usually? And then two, does he make any more money than a normal <laughs> street performer? And so the guy gets in there, he plays his guts out for like three hours and he makes like $32 and 33 cents. Yeah. And, and, you know, and you would think, well, you know, there's some excuses there. You might say, well, maybe many people didn't have any change. Maybe they knew it was special, but they just didn't have time to, you know, they're late for work. And, uh, and, and in fact, the Washington Post controlled for this. They actually interviewed all these people that passed him. So they interviewed a whole bunch of people to see. And, and it turned out nobody noticed anything. Like, in fact, a lot of people weren't even in a rush. There was like a lineup of people standing at a lottery kiosk buying lottery tickets like standing in line yeah <laughs> and they went and asked them and they said hey do you notice anything different about the music this morning and they're like nope just some guy trying to make a buck my yeah. favorite one was they interviewed this gal she had a shoe shine stand across the the spot from where he was playing and they asked her they said hey did you notice anything different about the music this morning and she said Oh yeah, I did. It was so loud. I was going to call the cops. <laughs> <laughs> mm. so, here, so here we are, right? Yeah. We got a guy with a world-class product, an absolutely amazing product, but I pick it up and I stick it beside the garbage can and nobody can recognize how awesome it is. Right. Now, if I went to the shoeshine gal and said, Hey, here's a ticket. There's this guy playing at the concert hall down the street and you gave her a ticket and she went into the concert hall and saw him dressed in his tuxedo up on mm -hmm. stage in the fancy room. And she's got a program that says he's a child prodigy from the age of two and all this stuff. <laughs> and everybody else yeah. in the room is clapping and stuff. Like even if she's not a classical music fan, she's going to look at that and go, Oh, that guy's a genius. Yeah. So, Context matters. It matters. Yeah. And for us in technology, when we're launching something into markets that are so outrageously crowded, like right. there are thousands and thousands of other options out there for customers, we got to find a way to bring the concert hall with us. Mm. And there's value in that context. It's not just done for fluff. It, right. I mean, it's the product's it's the same. To, it's done to teach you where to focus. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about how important um, benefits to the customer are versus features and attributes from the um, product manager's point of view. Because yeah. you've worked with a lot of startups and with a lot of tech you know, geniuses. How do you get them to leave the functionality behind, or do you, uh, to get into, okay, yeah, it, it but it does something that these people want uh, yeah. as opposed to what it does. 
that is a hard concept for mm-hmm. non-marketers in general. Like mm-hmm. the idea that it, we don't care about the features, we care about what the features can do for us. Right. And so, you know, so there's a, there's a couple of things. One is in tech, we are used to products that the the translation between features and features and benefits features and value is almost a given like for example you buy a camera and you right. mentally do that more megapixels is better because i get a clearer <laughs> picture when i zoom and yep. tech people know that so so they're like with their own products they're like well i should just be able to tell you you know how many you know whatever and you're like look no one's bought one of these before they don't actually know how to do that translation Right. So in the in the work that I do with companies, I take them through a process where we start with looking at competitive alternatives and then, okay, if this is the competition, these are the features that make us different from those things. And we can come up with a giant long set of features. And then we spend a piece of the workshops I do with folks doing this translation between features and value. So, you know, so uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm a customer. What does that mean? Right? Yeah. The prospect, the customer can, can quickly get to what's in it for me. Right. Uh, Is that something I care about? I care what you're going to do. Yeah. I'll pay you for something, but it's got to be able to do this. And this is based on megabytes. It's based on pictures. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So in the book, you, you, you go through the um, five components uh, plus bonus, how to do a effective positioning statement, and then practical things that you do make that positioning strategy uh, right. actually work in the marketplace. So these five components, um, you, you really start off that part of the book by saying, don't write a positioning statement. Oh, see, here, here, here's my problem with the positioning statement. What's really valuable about the positioning statement is the blank. <laughs> like yeah. the blanks are really important. Yeah. My market is super important. The, yeah. my, the value I get for customers, who's my competitor, you know, like all of this stuff is super, super important. I'm going to take positioning into its component pieces. I'm going to solve for the component pieces, smash it back together. And then I got it. Well, good positioning. And yeah. the component pieces I started with were the blanks and the positioning statement. And there's five of them. So it's yeah. market categories, competitive alternatives, uh, unique features, yeah. uh, value that those features can deliver for customers um, and which customers. Right. So then I decided, well, when how, all I got to do is figure out the right answer, the best answer for each of those things. Well, once yeah. you look at it, one of the things that's that's interesting is to realize all the component pieces have a relationship to each other. Right. So you know, if I could take any one of those component pieces, like um, the value that I can deliver is that's differentiated, is completely dependent on my differentiated features. Right. And my, but my differentiated features are only differentiated when I compare them to a competitive comparable. Mm -hmm. So those things are related. And they say, well, hang on. If I'm thinking about my target segment, like the customers I'm going after, they're really the customers that care the most about the value I can deliver. So those things are related. And then market category, at least my best market category is essentially the context that I'm going to position my product within that makes the value obvious to my customers I'm going after. So right. all things relate to each other. Then the, then the next challenge is, so if they're all a relationship to each other, where do you start? And right. for a long time, um, I was worried that the thing was actually a circle. Like, it, it, like there was, there was no good starting point. And what you had to do was, you know, pick a thing, get a candidate positioning, test it, and right. then, you know, and then if it didn't work after the drawing board and adjusted it, but then it, it, what happened was I, I started to do some, some digging into jobs to be done theory. Um, and uh, I've been a big fan of Bob Mesta and his yep. work. And that got me thinking about the starting point for this difficult concept, particular for technical founders, but from a customer perspective, um, if I could figure out what the competitive alternatives were, then everything could flow from that. Right. 
And so that got me to the idea that I actually need to start with who are my best customers? If I didn't exist, what would those best customers do instead? Mm -hmm. And then I could look at, okay, well, what features do I have that they, that those alternatives don't have? And then what's the value derived from those features? What customers care the most about that value? And then what's the context that makes that value obvious to those customers, which gets me to my positioning process. Right. And so that's how I reasoned it out. The, okay. the starting point is really important and it's actually the spot where everybody messes it up. Yeah. <laughs> so April, when you say best customer, find your best customer, isn't that, isn't that a very narrow uh, puzzle here? Like, I mean, don't founders want to be every, everybody? Isn't that the way you build a business? <laughs> you know? mm. this is, and this is, you know, it's interesting. It's, um, it, 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 in some ways, it's a hard thing for founders to get their heads around. And in other ways, it's not. One thing that I think is funny, like, you know, when you talk about, when you talk to founders and you talk about markets, you know, they, they yeah. want to go after big markets yeah. where, because, and mainly they've been taught that by investors because investors will ask them, how big's your addressable market? And it needs to be, you know, <laughs> billion dollars or else we're going to invest. We're usually starting in smaller markets where we fit really well. But yeah. it's interesting. I go to positioning workshops with clients of mine we start with this discussion of good fit customers and what I can get very quick agreement on, if you get a bunch of tech founders together is they'll say, look, um, you got a bunch of customers that are really good fit. And when I mean good fit, I mean, they, they intuitively understood the value of your product. They bought really quickly. Um, they, uh, they, they don't churn on you. They love your stuff. They recommend you to their friends. They're using right. the product as it was intended. They're not calling support every week. Um, and, and so every company has customers like that. And at the same time, every custom company has customers that are just a pain in the butt. Yes. <laughs> and they're like, yes. and they're like, and if you knew how bad they were going to be, you never would even close business with them because they're, right. they're terrible. Like they, they want the product to be something it's not. Every day is a struggle and all this stuff. So when I talk to companies about positioning, I'm like, look, you want to position your product. So you get a pipeline full of these good fit ones and you actively repel these pain in the butt ones. Yeah. <laughs> and every founder wants that. And every startup, if they've got a bit of traction, they got more than a dozen customers. They can say, oh yeah, these four, we love them. I wish everybody looked like these four. And yeah. then these two, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> so what we end up doing is let's just focus on the good ones and then yeah. let's build the positioning around them. And then when we get to the part where we're doing cost segmentation, we've already outlined what the unique value is yes. for the offering. And then we yeah. say, look, you could sell this to lots and lots and lots of people. But it is, there are only a small portion of people that are really going to go crazy for your stuff. And it's those small portion of people that you want to focus your very meager marketing and sales resources on because you're a tiny right. little company. So you just want to go out and sell the easiest people to sell. And then once you've sold all of them, then you'll work on the ones that are a little bit harder and a little bit harder and a little bit harder. And oh, by the way, you'll be bigger by then and you'll have more salespeople and all of this will be easier. But now yeah. you're small. You just want to be able to recognize what's a really good fit customer because those are going to be super easy to sell, super easy to close. Yeah. And I think as, as Michael Porter has pointed out over the years, you know, the, the core of a good strategy is what is it you're not going to do? Right what are you going to sacrifice? And um, it is tough to get, uh, whether they're founders or whether they're first year, third year brand manager to say, yeah, you're right. Those customers are costing me money and their cost. My opportunity cost is too high. Right. I, I can't spend enough time with the good customers that provide margin. Uh, and exactly. I, I know, yeah. And you know that you've been an uh, entrepreneur in residence. Um, you know, in several different accelerator centers. And it, it's tough to to have people understand that you're going to be successful. Don't worry about it. But you're only going to be successful if you can meet the value requirements of the best customers. 
That's right. That's exactly yeah. it. It's it's yeah. a hard, you know, it, it's counterintuitive in some oh, ways. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. People are like, well, if I go after a great big market, you know, I, all I got to do is this tiny oh. portion of this great big market. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but you're competing with everybody. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. And you can't yeah. win anywhere. But but April, there's 6 million customers in that category. Right. If I only get 10%, that's right. we'll be that's making right. money. That's no, right. that's right. that doesn't work out that way. But yeah. Um, yeah. And it feels scary to say, well, you know, we're going after a market like that only has, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can count the number of potential customers in the thousands. Like that's yeah. scary. scary. Uh, and actually, you know, if you look at successful, successful businesses, like especially B2B businesses that sell the businesses, mm -hmm. like that's exactly how they get started. Bingo. Yeah. Um, you tell an interesting story in the book about uh, cake on a stick where you use it as an example. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, some people just would take that. Well, I have a piece of cake on a stick. So that's that's differential. Uh, that's unique. Right. Yeah, I guess it is if you're a baker offering that product. But you go on then to uh, say, well, you know, maybe that's not what people are looking for. Maybe they want a something else, a cake pop. Well, the, the the example, again, I spent so much time trying to come up with like analogies for positioning mm -hmm, yeah. like, that would work with technical founders that don't necessarily have a background in marketing. And, and, and what I liked about that example, so the example I used was, you know, you're a baker and you decide you're going to do, and chocolate cake's your thing, and you're going to innovate on chocolate cake. And you decide you're gonna make innovative chocolate cake, but your chocolate, and so you go out and you 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 talk to customers, and what you come up with is this chocolate cake that's gonna be portable, and it's gonna be like a little morsel of cake, and it, it's gonna be portable, so I can drink a coffee in one hand and eat cake in the other hand. And yeah. so you come up with this thing, and it's you know it's like a ball of cake, and it's on a stick, and then and then I go to pitch it to like. Starbucks or somebody and say, Hey, you gotta, you gotta buy my innovative cake 2.0 thing, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. if I pitch it like cake and, and, and I'm still positioning it as cake, then I go in and I say, Hey, I got this cake thing and, and it's portable. So it's kind of a small piece of cake. And then I, I wanted to make it portable. So I need to put a handle on it. It's not really a handle. It's more like a stick. And so I got this innovative cake 2.0 cake on a stick thing. And the problem with that is that you position it as cake. So we know how to evaluate cake. And I'll tell you, you know what wins a cake contest? The cakiest cake in town. Like I want, <laughs> I want big, bigger is better in cake. I want yep. frosting. You didn't say anything about frosting. I don't know what the heck that stick is doing there. It doesn't belong in cake. The stick has nothing to do with cake. <laughs> I don't know why it's so small and round. It's weird. Everything about it is weird. And if we're having a cake contest, that thing loses. Now, I can take the exact same product and look at it and say, what's unique and amazing about the thing I came up with? And what's unique and amazing is not cake. It, it's, the, it's the form factor. It's the ball and the sprinkles and the stick and all that <laughs> stuff is cool. And how do I take that and put it in a context where all that stuff, instead of it being weird, it makes sense. And so I can I can take that same product and say, you know what, Starbucks lady, uh, you know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about a cool snack you could have with your coffee. And I got thinking about lollipops, except what I wanted to do is I want to make a lollipop for grownups that would taste good with coffee. So I made it at a cake. Ah. That's what a cake pop is. And, <laughs> and so I've taken the same thing but I've repositioned it in a market where all my cool stuff makes sense and is obvious. And in a lollipop contest, if you're talking to grownups, <laughs> cake pop wins. So yeah. that, and so that was one of my big examples I used to always use to try to, you know, explain how you can have a feature that sits outside of your market category that you think is really, really cool. But because it's outside of your market category, everybody just thinks it's weird. Yeah. Whereas I can pick it, pick it up put it in another market category and you're like, yeah, of course it's got a stick. It's a lollipop, man. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Right. Anybody could have thought of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So April, the MarTech 
situation in um, marketing and communications these days where there's really cool stuff. Uh, there's so account-based, cool yeah, there's so account-based marketing. There's, cool there's this and that. Use. And so thousands of products. Come on, is positioning really that important now that we have all this tech that can uh, save well, the world? Yeah, I get, I get asked this. You know, it's not a new concept, right? So so people are like, are we past that? Like, can we just growth hack our way out of this situation? <laughs> yeah. and, uh -huh. and, you know, what are you doing? You're talking about this stuff from the 80s, man. That's so old. And um, and and if you if you think about it, positioning defines how you're different and how you're better and who you're different and better for. And mm -hmm. the, the if you read the Reason Trout book, you know, they talk about how positioning is super important when you're operating in a crowded market. Well, our markets, like if they were crowded oh. when Reason Trout wrote that book in the 80s, mm -hmm. like it, like it's insane now. It's it's yeah. it's ridiculous now. It's a you know, Japanese subway during rush hour crowded. It's crazy. <laughs> and so if it was if it was important for our products to to stand out and be understandably yes. valuable to the people we're trying to communicate with if if that was important in 1982 then it is desperately important now it is the difference yes. between life and death of a company now yep. and so we actually need to be strongly positioned way more than ever before because our customers are way more overwhelmed than they ever have been before. Sure. And so all of the the newer channels, all of the newer uh, methodology is still dependent it's on- It's still dependent uh, on positioning. Like th this is still, like it does not matter what we do in marketing. Like, and I don't care what you're doing. Like, it, you, you know, you maybe you're doing some growth hacking thing. Maybe you're doing content marketing. Maybe you're doing digital ads. I don't care what you're doing. Any marketer, if they say, okay, I'm going to do a campaign of some sort right now, there's a fundamental set of inputs. Like the first thing you're going to say is, okay, so who's my target customer? Yeah. <laughs> and what's our value proposition? And how are we different? Who's our competitor? You know, like, and I yep. still have to answer those questions. And the right way to answer those questions is going to really, really impact what the results of my campaign are. If everything that comes in is garbage, everything that comes out is garbage. So. Yeah. You know, the results of my marketing campaigns are only going to be as good as the positioning that feeds it. So yeah. if we don't get this stuff right, then, you know, we're not going to be able to make, no matter how hotshot we are with the technology or how hotshot we are at execution of campaigns, if the inputs are bad, the outputs are bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I remember a question uh, from several years ago and, and someone asked me, Alan, why is, why is advertising so bad? my answer to that was i'm not sure that all the advertising is bad but just most of it isn't relevant right uh it's this shotgun approach right uh, now in those days broadcasting was not narrow casting it was mostly television broad. radio right yeah it was very broad and i think that's the the challenge and it certainly answers your point where you've got garbage in garbage out and okay what's your budget like next year and oh well it's the same as last year but we've added five percent or we've you know the accountability in in marketing communications and in branding has not been uh, as sharply drawn in the past as it is now where you've got the cfo uh now asking for well what were the results right um, well and okay not every not every campaign is going to hit a home run but they'll want to know um who did you reach? Why did you reach them? Uh, how often did you reach them? And what kind of movement did you see during the campaign? Not just at the end, but you know, it's it's gotten um, there's more science to our art um, than there used yeah. to be, and I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, I would just not like to see it taken over by algorithms, um, because here's the point that 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 I really loved in in your book, um, obviously awesome, is that you keep referring back to understanding like there, there's no way to understand the one-dimensional uh positioning statement where you fill in the four blanks hmm. it's just it's just 
it's like arithmetic, two plus two equals four. But your approach now is more like geometry, which is, okay, what's the depth behind this? What is the meaning? Is it important or isn't it important? So I think your approach to uh, positioning is way overdue. And I think people are going to um, really get a lot of value out of this writing. But also, April, you're doing workshops. Yeah, so I mean, I'm a consultant. That's sort of my jam. And mm -hmm. and the companies I work with are, uh, they tend to be, so I only work with tech companies. I only mm -hmm. work with companies that sell to businesses because B2B is sort of my jam. Yep. And, uh, and they range from uh, small companies, like you got to have some market traction or else, you know, what you have is a positioning thesis. You don't, there's nothing <laughs> to write up yet, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so but once you've got some market traction uh, and I work with companies that small all the way up to like bigger companies with weirder positioning problems where, mm -hmm. you know, they're, you know, maybe their market has gotten more crowded or their own product has changed and, and it requires a shift in positioning. And so right. the, the main sort of first entry point for people to work with me is to do a workshop. So we do these kind of two day things where it's, it's a guided discussion. We get the executive team in the room together and we work through um, the five component of pieces of positioning. And then we work through translating that into what I would call a sales narrative. So mm. how would you tell that story to a prospect that doesn't really know too much about you. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then, then you're, you're also offering, which I think is all is incredibly valuable. These, uh, these two hour courses to existing uh, marketing and branding people uh, that either need a refresher or they need to have the old concept flushed out yeah. uh, of their brains. I mean, it's, it's hard to learn something new when you, you haven't given up what's old. So well, you, that's you're it. coming in and doing those. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, these are, these are more, I do these more for big companies. So occasionally I'll get calls from, from big companies, including, uh, big, big companies that I have firsthand knowledge that their positioning process isn't that great. And, mm. uh, and so, Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Oh. And so, uh, <laughs> and so uh, what I do for them, like, a lot of these companies have, you know, much like IBM, their own product release process. And yeah. what they want to do is kind of update that piece of it. And so I go in and essentially teach their, um, you know, either it's either the marketing team or the product marketing team. Sometimes it's marketing and product management. Yeah. Um, but I teach them the methodology and then, and then they can then take that methodology and figure out how to use it internal in their own organization. Right. Do you ever go back? to uh, check on them after your initial workshop? Oh yeah, so I have I have lots of companies where I've done, um, where, you know, we've done the initial workshop and some, some folks, if they've got tricky positioning challenges or where we ended up on the workshop is something drastic, uh, mm -hmm. Some of them will keep me around on a retainer for a few months yep. after that, just to just to help them work through the actual execution on the shift right. of positioning. Yep. Um, but I've had lots of lots of clients where we've done the initial workshop and and then things have changed. Like you fast forward six sure. months down the road or or a yep. year down the road, and the, the market landscape has changed a little bit. Sometimes they do an acquisition. Sometimes there's just, it's one of their competitors has done an acquisition, mm -hmm. changes the market landscape. And then we do a little checkup and sometimes we'll do a refresh on the positioning based on yep. that. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous. So the name of the book uh, written by April Dunford is obviously awesome. How to nail product positioning. So customers get it, buy it and love it. And this is available, of course, I have my copy from Amazon and uh, <laughs> I have the hard copy and uh, uh, I would think it also comes in Kindle. Yeah, you can you yeah. can get it on Kindle or Kobo if you're Canadian yes, and, you, right, and yeah. you do that, you can do that too. Um, or you can get a, a paperback version from okay. Amazon or Chapters or wherever you like to buy books. There you go. And I can also, and I would suggest that you go to April's website, uh, www.aprildunford.com, uh, if you want to learn some more 
or if you want to contact April for some uh, assistance. And uh, this woman has a fabulous reputation as a consultant because what she's going to help you with is doable. Okay, uh, we've all dealt with consultants in our past or in even in our presence that are really good at the theory um, and they have it packaged up nicely. But the execution or the implementation is not uh, maybe even possible, let alone probable. So uh, this is where I, I believe April brings something different to the table, something unique. She has positioned herself wisely. And, <laughs> <laughs> sure and, so. and well, yes, you have. And uh, that's what makes it work. So April, thank you very much for being on AQ's Blog and Grill. Um, we Thanks have so having me. enjoyed our conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, we'll be sharing this with the audiences very soon. AQ's Blog and Grill.